Welcome to my new calculus channel. I am John Gabriel. In this video, I'm going to be talking about academic ignorance and stupidity. Uh, this is part three of the series, and I trust you have seen part one and part two and learned a lot from those two videos. Um, in this video, I'd like to talk about how mainstream academics uh, make up really very bad definitions, or let's call them ill-formed definitions. In fact, most definitions in mainstream mathematics are either terribly flawed or contain a lot of ambiguity or are contradictory in some way or other and eventually lead to theory that is completely unsustainable and so complex it can't be taken any further. So <coughs> in this video I'm going to deal with just five concepts but there are many more in mainstream mathematics that are ill-formed or ill-defined but five concepts that are very badly defined and have actually led to uh, misunderstanding, ambiguity, and wrong ideas in general. The very first one I'd like to talk about is the irrational number. Now before I continue, mathematicians like to define things by things they are not. <laughs> so an irrational number is defined as a number that is not rational. There's a very big problem with this. Well, in order to say any given magnitude is a number, it has to be measured or measurable. In other words, it must be measured by the unit. So, just saying that it is a number that is not rational makes no sense at all because it hasn't been established that that magnitude is indeed a number. In fact, the only true numbers are the rational numbers. There are no numbers beyond the rational numbers. Okay? So, mathematicians will say any rational number is a number that cannot be expressed as A over B. Well, <laughs> if it cannot be expressed as A over B where A and B are integers, then it's not a rational number. But to say it is an irrational number makes no sense whatsoever because it hasn't been established that it is a number. Okay, Remember, a number is the measure of a magnitude. A number is the measure of a magnitude, not the partial measure, not the partial measure, not the, approxi not the approximate measure. Just let me write this out. A number is the measure of a magnitude. Not the approximate measure, the exact measure of a magnitude. Okay? Exact. So, things like pi, which is a ratio of magnitudes, not numbers. It could be, you could have one number in the top or bottom, but one of them will be an incommensurable magnitude. It's a ratio of magnitudes, okay? Magnitude 1 and magnitude 2. Now, either both of them are irrational or at least one of them are irrational. And the other one can be a number. But in any event, the ratio itself is never a number, okay? It's always a magnitude, an incommensurable magnitude incommensurable magnitude. Alright, incommensurable, as you all know from my other video on derivation of numbers, means a number that has no common measure with any other number. So, this is the first bad concept in mathematics, that an irrational number is defined as something it's not. Okay, so that doesn't really fly. In according to my logic, and I think I'm more intelligent than most people. So, let's look at the next concept, which is equally bad. The derivative defined in terms of limits, okay? The derivative defined in terms of limit. Now, if you have a curve with a tangent like that, 
normally according to mainstream mathematics if this is the point x then the derivative at x is equal to the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h yes okay these here are all finite differences that means if you have secants like this and, and you constantly take the finite difference as these secants become closer to the tangent closer to this tangent here then this finite difference gets closer to the slope of the tangent in other words in other words what this definition here is saying the derivative is defined by all the finite differences that contain the point x except the most important one the one at x really what we want to know is what is the slope of the tangent line at x right so this this here this Cauchy definition uh, French mathematician was actually intended to fix the problems of Newton and Leibniz but it made matters a lot worse in fact introducing limits was a big problem and it hasn't solved the problem of rigor which I've solved with my new calculus okay in the new calculus there are no limits there is no use of infinity or infinitesimals so this is a bad definition because it says <laughs> the derivative here of the tangent line depends on the finite differences in this interval in this interval okay very bad definition it's defined by everything that it's not what it is is over here not here or here or here or here okay so those are two examples let's take a look at another one now another three and then we'll wrap up okay the third one is the Lebesgue outer measure so the Lebesgue or Lebug, whatever way you pronounce it doesn't really matter says that the sum of uh, the length of an interval right let's call it interval k from k equals 1 to infinity it's actually the either the in this case here it's the greatest lower bound or or, or inf okay the greatest lower bound or inf now what Lebesgue Lebag said here <laughs> was that if you have an interval a b like that then you could split it up into intervals and summing all these intervals will give you b minus a and of course uh, if you go to infinity that means you have infinitely many divisions or what mathematicians think of as points so in essence what this pathetic definition, definition here is saying is that if you sum up all the points in this interval you'll have, uh, you'll have the, the length of the measure of this the set but of course you cannot sum points because points have no size no dimension or extent but this is the rut that began with George Cantor okay? George Cantor, Cantor was a delusional fool who was the father of set theory and also the father of all mathematical cranks um, so what you see here is theory that was actually built on the rotten ideas the delusional ideas of George Cantor um, Henri Lebug or Lebeg whatever uh, came up with this definition for outer measure which is as you can see a complete load of hogwash and this tries to define an interval in terms of points but really uh, as I mentioned in another video of mine if you have two points the length is just the shortest distance between these two points there are many other aspects of length but in this particular case we're, we're looking at distance and so we're only concerned with the length of a straight line not area or volume or hypervolume or anything else uh, incidentally on real bugs uh, discoveries serve no purpose in mathematics and are not required in any mathematics whatsoever in other words a complete load of junk so 
let's go on to the next concept, which is an infinite sum. Right. Now, an infinite sum is defined as the limit of a sequence. So, which fool was responsible for this definition? I'll give you a clue. Euler Wagba Euler Wagba Euler. Okay. Euler. The Swiss mathematician Euler. He was the fool behind this definition. So, for example, <coughs> he defined this sum to be <laughs> this infinite sum to be the limit which is a third okay the limit is the least upper bound in modern terms you'll see that being referred to as sup okay but they're the same thing sup stands for supremum and inf stands for infimum okay now Euler defined this sum here to be equal to the limit of the sum well if you think about that very carefully, it's a very bad definition because this, this uh, particular sum here can never be determined. And if you treat it as you would uh, an example in Lebesgue's outer measure or Lebesgue's outer measure, you'll see that it's complete nonsense because such a sum cannot be evaluated as points. Okay or even as intervals because you would have to look at uh, a term here uh, required to be zero in order to arrive at a third given that a third is not measurable in base 10 in other words you cannot express a third in base 10 and I've explained this in another video of mine uh, in, in great detail so I won't do it here so defining this definition is a very bad definition and obviously it shouldn't have been done. It has led to a lot of problems like the one I've just explained and also the fallacy that that is equal to 1. That's not true if this is considered to be a number. Okay, This here is not a number. If it's considered to be a sequence, then this is true. But if it's considered to be a number, it's not true. One has to first establish that anything with an ellipsis behind it is a number but nothing with an ellipsis behind it is a number. All right, so there's one more left. Uh, George Cantor's infinite set. So let's just go back here again. Now, mathematicians simply swallowed this hook, line, and, sin hook, line, and sinker, as they say. Um, George Cantor defined an infinite set to be a set that is <coughs> not finite. Again, defining a set by something that it's not. Well, by the very original de definition of set, it has to be finite because a set is a collection of objects. And if you look at infinite, well, an inf infinite implies it has no limits, it can't be measured. Therefore, how can it be a set? The problem with anything infinite is that infinity cannot be refied. Infinity cannot be refied. That means there is no way to instantiate a cons the infinity concept either as a tangible or intangible example. Okay? There is no way to refi infinity. <coughs> and so this here has led to many problems in mathematics because infinity is an ill-formed concept or what I would call a junk concept that doesn't belong in rational thought and so George Cantor was the father of this ill-formed theory which has taken root in mathematics uh, it's unfortunate because finite set theory is useful and uh, infinite set theory has become very complex um, well one, one shouldn't be surprised because it's based on something that cannot be refied uh, uh, George Cantor really 
cause a lot of problems in mathematics and I could sit and speak for hours about all the bad ideas of George Cantor and it wouldn't serve any purpose at all because his theory is really quite useless. Um, now, we've looked at five concepts which have, which are either ill-formed or defined as something that they're not. Um, there are many more, there are many more concepts in mathematics, I should say mathematics rather because it's not true mathematics, that are ill-formed and cannot be uh, used in rational thought or in the progress of mathematics. Well, I hope you have enjoyed this little presentation of academic ignorance and stupidity. And I have to tell you that I have nothing but utter contempt for the morons in mainstream academia. Um, so I just can't control myself when it comes to my loathing for them. At any rate, uh, their stupidity is infinite, and I suppose that spending too much time on this sort of thing is not very fruitful. Uh, hopefully, these things will change. Whether I'll be alive still or not, that's a different story. But I'm going to be an advocate for changing mathematics so that students don't simply just give up when they get to university and discover that they have to learn a whole lot of rubbish in order to get a degree. This is the New Calculus Channel. I'm John Gabriel. Hope you have enjoyed watching this presentation. See you next time.